So today I'm going to talk about one uh, important step in the evolution of Gen AI. And I'd like to take you there by way of analogy with web search. So you may ask, like, what does web search have to do with Gen AI? Well, what do I do with web search? I ask a question. Some technology operates on that question. It returns some text, and then I take that text to be knowledge. Well, what am I doing with Gen AI? I ask a question. Some technology operates on the question, returns some text, and I take that text to be knowledge. All right, so let's go with this. If you go back to mid-90s, you had somewhere around like at peak 30, 40 companies that were all doing this really impressive thing, very useful, new, which is indexing the entire World Wide Web and providing a full text search interface on top of it. And at the time, it looked like this was just going exponential until Google came around in 2000. And not only did they launch the world's largest search engine, but they brought a new way of a new solution to bear, which is PageRank, which happens to be a graph algorithm. Um, and, uh, and that ensures the most important results always come up first in a world where it was very easy for people to gamify full text. Then started a new era. That new era lasted about a decade until Google disrupted themselves yet again um, with something called the knowledge graph. And what's significant about this, uh, and this was laid out in this amazing uh, historic, I would say, blog post called Think, introducing the knowledge graph, things not strings, is that what Google realized after 15 or so years of you know, an industry using techniques around manipulating strings, that to go further, you actually needed to understand what those strings were. And the knowledge graph was a way to catalog all the things uh, in a way to that you could disambiguate them and understand Am I looking for Rio the city? Am I looking for Rio the movie? Am I looking for Rio the hotel? Um, Google doesn't publish stats on their knowledge graph. Last I heard, it was, uh, you know, there are companies that make a living out of estimating this, around 55 billion nodes, a trillion and a half relationships. And what uh, kept Google ahead of the game was changing the game and introducing knowledge into what previously had been a game of manipulating strings. That era lasted another 12 years, up until, I don't know if anyone caught this at Google I.O., um, they announced yet another disruption, disrupting themselves again. And here you can see the example uh, through which they launched this, uh, which is asking quite a complex question. This is much more complicated than something that a web search or even a knowledge graph or page rank could bring back. And the question is, my family and I are going to Miami for Labor Day. My son loves art and my husband really wants fresh seafood. Can you pull my flight and hotel info from Gmail and help me plan the weekend? So then they actually show a visual and explain how they solve this problem. You can see, guess that an LLM is involved, but what they did is they uh, pulled a knowledge graph together, actually pulled from a knowledge graph a mini view of the world model that's relevant to the question being asked, the data around it, the person asking the question, the data around her, and um, feeding it to an LLM. So the evolution of web search is uh, you know, yet another disruption in this long journey converging into Gen AI, where Google's now using LLMs plus GraphRag to get better results to complex questions. So let's come back to Gen AI. So you've all probably seen charts like this of like massive amounts of spend going towards Gen AI and huge predictions. This, this chart says that by 2032, 12% um, of uh, all IT budgets will be Gen AI related. But latest stats um, are that 71% of organizations are stuck piloting Gen AI projects. And whether you believe it's 70% or 80%, um, certainly my conversations with developers, with technology execs reflect this, that it's really easy to get to a really impressive prototype or POC. But if you're dealing with an enterprise and the various you know, higher bars that you have around compliance and 
brand and reputational stakes and high dollar value and bias uh, and ethical risks, um, a lot of things just get stuck. Y you need a much higher bar to go to production. And I'll call this the Gen AI go to production barrier. And so if I recap the last two years, we've basically seen okay, people usually try their best with LLMs, big models, small models, fine tuning, multi-shot, and you've still not got this barrier. It's not good enough. Then you bring in RAG with vectors. That raises the bar. Now I can do more. I can get more of those product projects to production. It's still not good enough for a number of important use cases. And this is where GraphRag comes in. Now what's GraphRag? GraphRag is essentially RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, where in the retrieval path, you include a lookup to a knowledge graph. This isn't exclusive of vectors. Oftentimes, uh, most often when I see graph rag being done, you include a vector lookup. But this is adding additional value uh, from some manifestation of the, the concrete, what I know about the world model of, again, the person, uh, the subject, and the objects involved. And I've, I'm starting to see, and there's been lots of evidence, publications, showing that you get better answer quality, explainability, security. For all these reasons, GraphRag seems like it's breaking the next barrier. Um, probably it'll be an S-curve. This is just the way the world goes. But we're very early on uh, in that S-curve. And it seems like it is unlocking uh, many use cases, which is exciting. So what do we mean, what do we mean by graphs? Well, here you've got the commerce transaction graph, just as an example, again, it's the subjects and objects of what you're, the data that you're dealing with. The product and parts graph, yet another common graph. Digital twin, which is kind of a generic term for take the, the real world, the connected real world, and um, bring it down uh, into uh, a graph representation. The real world just shows up as a set of connected things. Graphs is, are just such a natural way to represent them, and they also give you this uh, amazing flexibility of being able to bring in new data without having to mess with the schema and do um, uh, schema migrations and so on. So if I recap the benefits that we're seeing from GraphRag, uh, it boils down to three things. Number one is better answers, and some of this has to do with better accuracy, but some of this also has to do with more useful answers that, uh, that go a step deeper. And I'll show an example of that. Um, number two is easier development. Um, being able to actually visualize your graph. And then third is around explainability and governance. So let's dive into those. Here's an example. And at our booth downstairs, we've got lots of examples like this where you can ask a question using vector plus LLM and then ask a, uh, add graph rag ins and see what the difference is. And in this example, this was taking an Edgar SEC data set, ingesting it into a knowledge graph, vectorizing everything, and then asking the question, which asset managers are vulnerable to a lithium shortage? You can see how, like, if you run a hedge fund, this might be a billion dollar question. If something just happened, there's some lithium shortage, and I need to respond to that and, and rebalance my assets. And the vector answer, I would say, is accurate. It's companies that produce batteries, companies that have uh, th things, uh, other sorts of um, minerals that move along with the lithium supply chain, et cetera. The graph rag answer gives you a list of 10 companies. Just think of how much more actionable this is. Like, you know, to get from the previous answer to this one uh, might take a few days, literally, of research. So this is why I say better answers and not just better quality. Um, next, you have easier development. Uh, so of course, you have to build your knowledge graph. And fortunately, uh, there are a lot of techniques uh, that are coming into being, including using LLMs to build knowledge graphs from un unstructured data. If you've got knowledge graphs, if you've got structured data, that's a pretty cut and dry operation of bringing that into the knowledge graph. We've been doing this for years. Um, and it turns out that if you have structured data to refer to, your um, unstructured knowledge graph construction can be a bit easier because um, you have some terminology to refer to and maybe even like an ontology taxonomy to refer to. 
Um, so you can see the difference, and we've had developers come back and say, wow, just you know, being able to even visualize the structure of my vectors, this is called a lexical graph, and it's maybe getting a little bit more advanced, but you have the domain graph, but you can also create a graph of the structure of your chunks and how those relate to tables and places in the text uh, and collections and authors and so on. And then the third is explainability and governance. Um, on the governance side, the graph gives you hooks through which you can apply fine-grained access controls, uh, which is a challenge, right, with LLMs and vectors. Um, and then on the explainability side, to the degree that I feed a graph to the LLM that either has the answer or has input into the answer, I get either like a white box or a gray box. All right, in the title, I use the word necessary. So when are knowledge graphs necessary for Gen AI? Well, I won't say they're broadly necessary for Gen AI, but I'd say for many enterprise use cases, they are. And here's how I think about this. It's a question of stakes. Higher stakes, you have a higher bar. Um, so low stakes, if I'm writing a children's bedtime story, then probably I don't need a knowledge graph, probably I don't need vectors, I probably just need a you know, pretty good foundation model. High stakes, if I have an exact answer, I'm doing machinery maintenance, there, there is no tolerance for error at all. And so there you have to use, bring determinism into an equation where LLMs and vectors are, are non-deterministic. You're, you're loading the dice, you can load the dice pretty well, but you're never going to know exactly, and it's always going to be opaque. And then in between is I have a human in the loop, that human has some level of expertise, they can override the decision. Here, a knowledge graph might still add value. Um, it might not be absolutely necessary, but maybe like two, three years out, it becomes more necessary because all the, comp all the competition, everyone in the space is doing that, and that raises the bar. If you want to learn more about this, I wrote this piece a couple months ago um, called a Graph, Ma graph Rag Manifesto uh, with a reference to this sort of uh, Blue, Link Blue Links era of rag and the analogy you saw earlier. So um, if nothing else, zoom down at the very bottom. There are some great links that you can follow for um, learning more and workshops and um, other blog posts uh, to, to get you started. So hopefully this gives you a picture of how LLMs, knowledge graph, vectors, one big happy family, uh, th these can all be complementary and additive. And if you want to learn more, um, my colleague Allison Cassette has a talk in this room tomorrow at 2.30. And we've got lots of folks at the Neo4j booth downstairs ready to answer questions. Thank you very much.